It is good to have all of you here this morning. And uh, you're probably wondering, are we having a party? No, we're not. But uh, let me pray real quick. That, it, by the way, I've mentioned Doug in passing in a couple of messages. That was Doug Van Hoff, and uh, I love that guy. And uh, what, what a man who's, who loves Christ. Boy, it just bleeds out through his pores. Uh, let me pray. Lord, thank you for the opportunity for us to be in this place. And as we uh, move forward into this time of continued worship, this is of great importance to us this moment. I thank you for it. I thank you for those that make it a priority to be in family-wide worship. And I pray that you would speak to them. If you haven't already, the hymns, the lyric, rich stuff, good stuff. Holy, holy Lord God Almighty. Thank you, Lord. May you uh, remind us of that holiness and the fact that indeed, as Hebrews, that verse was quoted by, uh, by Doug, you have made perfect forever those who are being made holy. That's a process. Help us towards that end. Thank you for the body of Christ in your name. Amen. We're walking through the book of Acts. The book of Acts is the story of the birth and the spread of the church. Now, the church is not a building. It is not a time of day or week. It is who we are. We come into a meeting place. That's what this is. Together, once a week, and we try to make it count. Let me share uh, a piece of scripture. Uh, we're going to be moving into Acts chapter 2 this morning, verses 14 through 41. And uh, it is a, an opportunity for us to, before we get there, I want to uh, highlight a couple of things. You note the fact that there are balloons on stage. I was trying to do some calculations this past week, and I'm not very good at math, but I did get a few on my own before I had to call out and get some help. I'm really, seriously, I'm not a great, when, let, let me, let me be a, humbly confess, and perhaps it's a sad note, but it's true. When it came to letters being a part of mathematics, I was out the door. So that didn't take me very far in math relative to algebra, I guess, is where you start getting H's and L's and Q's and whatever else. So, um, so if you can imagine far more balloons than what I pumped up. I was getting dizzy, so I stopped. But here's the illustration. Inside each one of us, there are 24 hours to a day. We have seven days a week. I have this kind of a, in a box on your outline on that right-hand side. There are seven days a week, and there are a total of 168 hours inside those seven days. Inside those 168 hours, if you calculate that out into minutes, you have 10,080 minutes per week given to us to live. Okay? Each day is comprised of 10,080 minutes. Okay? Imagine, if you will, there are 10,080 balloons up here all over the place that would comprise the amount of time that we have given to us each and every week. What we try to comprise or try to uh, limit ourselves to on a Sunday morning when it comes to this time, what we call family-wide worship, I would say it would be plus or minus close to 70 minutes, all things told. And so what I did, this is where I needed that phone call. Uh, what I did is I calculated or had calculated for me what 70 minutes works into divided into 10,080 minutes. And at the end of the day, it is that figure you have, 0.00694% of 10,080 minutes is devoted to family-wide worship. This moment here. So here's, here's, the, here's the 70 minutes, the 00694 percentage next to all of these other balloons, which if you multiplied them and we had 10,080, you would see that it was rather minute. So we want to make the most of it. Do we not? We do. Uh, we do. Uh, what is the very first activity 
uh, that, was, uh, that ushered in the start of the church, um, the church era. At the end of the day, one element inside our worship uh, remains a non-negotiable. Uh, again, can you guess what it might be? What's that? <laughs> well, I'm not going to argue the prayer's really right up there, of course. Yes. That's good, Judy. That's real good. Yeah. Uh, there are a lot of good ones. One piece of what we call worship that is a bedrock that we cling to, and you spoke to that when we interviewed you a year ago, and we re remain steadfast in, is preaching. Preaching. The very first event that took place in church history, starting the church era, following the coming of the Holy Spirit, is a sermon given by Peter. A sermon given by Peter. That's our focal point this morning in chapter 2 of, of Acts. And it, the, fact that the, the, the fact of the matter is Christ-centered preaching is what the book of Acts is all about. Example after example. In Acts chapter 4, verse 2, it records that the Jewish officials, the Jewish officials were, quote, greatly annoyed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming uh, in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. They were preaching. They were sharing. In Acts chapter 5, it says that despite this displeasure, every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. In Acts chapter 8, verse 4, after the persecution of the church begins, those who were scattered went about preaching, sharing the word. Uh, Acts 8 records the preaching of Philip and Peter and John in the, to the Samaritans and Philip to the Ethiopian eunuch. It also describes the further preaching ministry of Philip. In Acts chapter 9, it kicks off, it kickstarts the ministry of the Apostle Paul, who immediately upon his conversion proclaimed or preached or taught Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. In Acts chapter 11, 20 and 21, describes the ministry of men from Cyprus and Cyrene who went to Antioch and began to speak to Greeks also, telling them the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a great number of people believed and turned to the Lord. So why? Here, why, why is preaching, why is the ministry of the Word such a priority for the church? Why was it that it was the match that started the era of the church? The answer is it reflected the example modeled by Jesus himself. At the very outset of his earthly ministry, it says that Jesus began to preach, saying, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, Matthew's gospel, and also in, the, in Mark and Luke. In Luke chapter 4, verse 43, Jesus said, quote, I must preach, I must preach. The good news of the kingdom of God to the other towns as well. For I was sent for this purpose. They, if you remember that story in the context, they were saying, hey, it's, hey there are more people that need to see you here. They, they, more people are, are interested in you. They want something from you. And he says, no, I need to go elsewhere. Why? Because I need to preach the kingdom of God. I need, I need, I need, to, I need to speak to what my mission was, to seek and to save the lost. Throughout his ministry, Jesus continued to preach and teach. He instructed his disciples, quote, As you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. He said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim, preach the gospel to the whole creation, Mark 16. And then Paul, Paul sums up the priority of preaching when he says in 1 Corinthians 1, 17, he said, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Historically, historically, preaching was held a, was held a central role in the revival and the expansion of the church. I like history. I love history. Uh, those who don't remember or don't retain history, 
it says, are prone to repeat it. Uh, but I like history. The 1500s, the Reformation, which recovered the, the faith, was initiated and spread largely through the revival of preaching by men like John Knox, Luther, Calvin, Swingley. In the 1600s, at the core of the great strength of 17th century Puritanism, uh, it was its emphasis on sound biblical teaching. The 1700s, the Great Awakening came about through preaching by men such as George Whitfield, John Wesley, and Jonathan Edwards. And in the 1800s, great evangelists like D Dwight L. Moody arrived along with giants in the pulpit like Spurgeon and Alexander McLaren. Romans chapter 10 says this, But how are they to call on him in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching, sharing? And how are they to preach unless they are, what, sent? outside these four walls. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. And so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. I scribbled this in the side of my message this morning as I went through it. I said, you know, if we're not telling, we're not selling. Selling the joy, the prominence the security, the counsel, the light of our highest treasure. Who is that? It's Jesus. If we're not telling, we're not selling. Um, three questions that I have been challenged to ask in preparing a message. And uh, one, does the sermon say what the passage says? Uh, if you dig and you, you dig into the passage, you, you bring it out, what's out of it, it's called ex, out of exegesis. You're taking something and grabbing it from outside the text, or rather, you're bringing out from the text that which is intended to be shared. When you, when you come into a passage looking for something and looking for something to say, uh, and you want to find a verse to just kind of collaborate or whatever, uh, so often that can turn into being something called eisegesis, reading into the text and pulling something out of it. So one of the questions I'm, I'm always faced with is, does the sermon say what the passage says? Is it true to the text? Second is, is it a sermon? Versus a lecture. There's a difference between preaching and teaching. There may be teaching involved in preaching, but there's, it, there's a difference. It, it, uh, it's worth a sit down and talk. If anybody, it, there's a difference. And, and third, is it Christ, Christian? Is it Christian? Definition, a message that might, might entail you being thrown out or, or discriminated against in another public forum, if you start talking about the, the Word of God in a manner that they are offended because they might not believe that which you are sharing. All this has been said for two reasons. Two reasons. And I'll try to add an application point for all of us. Number one, it reminds us to never allow the ministry of the Word to be neglected. We have 70 minutes we give, which is 0.00694% of the 10,080 minutes. And of those 70 minutes, I really believe that this time is crucial. I believe the front end portions of a service, they prepare the hearts and tenderize the mind and heart for the reception of the Word of God. It reminds us never to allow the Word, the ministry of the Word to be neglected. And number two, it moves me to plead with you to pray for the pulpit ministry. There's going to be a day when someone else will be standing here ministering to you with 
uh, from the pulpit. My prayer is that as you, as you select and as you search and as you process and as you interview, that you find someone who has an unwavering passion to communicate with integrity and with passion the Word of God. The Word of God. There are too many pulpits filled with those who say what the itching ears want to hear. Or they want to preach topically all the time. That's dangerous. And although, here's the application point, although most Christians do not preach sermons, each one of us as confessing Christ followers, we have many opportunities to speak about Christ. We are, Scripture says, we are living epistles. We are living epistles, letters, if you will. We're living letters read by all men. If you've made a declaration of being one who loves Christ and you're a Christian, you go to church and someone knows that in your work spot or your school or wherever, man, believe me, they are watching you. You're a living letter read by all men. We are. Let's get into the text here if we could. Reminder, first one coming right out of the box is this. In verses 14 through 16, don't get distracted by or lost by the hook. This, this here, this illustration of balloons as a, as a visual to open up the message was a hook. And I don't know whether it worked or not, but it was a hook. It was attempting to get you into where we're going in the morning, into the text. Don't get distracted or lost by the hook. As a massive crowd is a, appears following the amazing uh, signs of wind and tongues of fire, first part of chapter 2, and they are, making, they are making opinions known. Peter, he steps up and he achieves focus. He steps up, he stands up, and he, he achieves focus. And he says here to listen up. Don't get distracted by what you just heard and saw. He said these men, they were being accused of, of being drunk. These men are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day. It's 9 o'clock in the morning for Pete's sake. They're not drunk, but know this, he goes on, there is significance to what just happened. This is a watershed moment. He then weaves together, he weaves together a powerful apologetic, that means a defense of the faith, a powerful apologetic and evangelistic and evangelistic sermon utilizing quotes from Scripture. It's incredible, this, this, this fisherman fairly unschooled, what he retains, what he remembers as he shares with these people. Core truths, there are a few of them as you see from your outline. Number one, below, below, know this, the last days, they have begun. They have begun. Verses 17 and following, the, the, the match has been lit. He says, this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. What you have just seen, this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. That's happening now, friends. That's what he says. The messianic era, which stretches between the two comings of Christ, is the age of the Holy Spirit where his ministry is seen and felt in abundance. Uh, the Spirit is being poured out like a heavy downpour, and it is affecting all types of people. It's not discriminating. All types of people. He says inside the context of this message, there are no social distinctions. It's touching sons and daughters. There are no age distinctions, young men and old men, and no class or rank distinctions. He cites servants, slaves, is the real word in the text. Peter refers to this Old Testament text from Joel first because it was the clearest and most obvious prophecy detailing the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. We are living inside these last days. We are. We are. God has graciously called we, 
I mean, you, someone might be Jewish here, but we, we Gentiles, God has graciously called we Gentiles to salvation and has chastised Israel for her unbelief. And what we see here in Acts chapter 2 and continue to experience in the here and now is really a preview of what will be blown out in the millennium or the millennial kingdom. It is in the millennial, uh, millennium kingdom, God will pour out his spirit on all since all who enter the kingdom will be saved. During this church era, God pours out his spirit into believers. In the millennium kingdom, there will be perfect peace. Isaiah chapter 9, verse 7, there will be perfect peace. Um, peace, peace now, now rules, now rules in the hearts of believers who have been drawn to the Father. And let me just pause and ask that question. One day, peace will be, will be apparent all over. There will be in the millennium kingdom. But peace should now rule your heart and my heart. If we've been touched by the Holy Spirit, we've come to know him as Lord and Savior. And thus, and thus, and thus, there would be or should be a, 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 a noticeable difference in how we approach life on every front. We know what it is to cast all of our cares on him because we know that he cares for us. We know what it is to have the peace that passes all understanding, blows us away. It's not perfect. We'll drop the ball. We'll, we'll tense up. But peace now rules in the hearts of believers who have been drawn to the Father. In the millennium kingdom, Christ will, will reign over all. Uh, Luke chapter 1, uh, he reigns now in the hearts of all who know him and listen to his voice. And one of the ways we listen to his voice is through the word of God and prayerfully, prayerfully, prayerfully through those who stand where I stand and declare to you the word of God, prayerfully. In the millennium kingdom, Christ will judge all men. He now, he now judges his own through the Spirit's convicting work in their lives. That's you and me. It's, it's a moment, a season of, of refinement. It's a, it's a season, a moment of transformation, of changing and becoming more like him. And along the way, having people say, wow, you are so different from when you graduated in high school go to a class reunion, they go, man, you have really changed. What's that? That's a door that just cracked open, allowing you to tiptoe into it and speak to why there's been that change. Between the day of Pentecost and the day of the Lord, there stretches a good period where the story of Jesus is to be told and the opportunity to respond given. Part of that story details Jesus' life and ministry. Uh, Peter, gosh, Peter, Peter, who, who, along with all the rest, ran and hid and, and denied. He's now standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice boldly, shoulder to shoulder, with the others preaching in the shadow of the temple. And he says, Jesus was a man attested to you by God with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst as you yourselves know. And here's the kicker, number two. This is a presentation. This is a sharing. The first point is that the last days have begun. Number two, you, you, and I, you and I, Willingly put Jesus to death. But the parenthesis to the point is this. God the Father was behind it all. Verses 22 and 23. It was no accident. It was no accident. 
Each one of us, as stained sinners, we dealt a blow of persecution and torture. Uh, each one of us cried out for his death, crucify him, crucify him. One of the most potent or penetrating hymns that we sing near the season of, of, of uh, Lent. Were you there? Were you there when they crucified my Lord? And the answer is yes. Yes. But, but, buts are powerful. But our action was supplemental. It was supporting actor-like to God, the Father's leading role. Through Jesus' death, God, the Father's saving purpose, was being uh, worked out. Praise God. Praise the Father. Praise the Son. <sighs> you and I willingly put Jesus to death. At some point, as you're sharing with someone, at some point, you're going to have to cross that bridge and talk about being a sinner. You're going to need to talk about the need to recognize the huge chasm between the perfection and the desire of God's heart that you might be one with him and where you're at. At some point, you're going to have to say, you know what? You're a sinner. So am I. God desires to touch your life. Third, God raised Jesus to life. Verses 24 through 32 in this, this sermon, Peter contrasts Jesus', uh, Jesus burial with David's burial, uh, quoting from Psalm 16. He says that while David's burial was permanent, Jesus' burial was just as real, but it was temporary. It was temporary. Uh, God raised him up, he says. Uh, he says, loosing, loosing the pains of death because it was not possible for him to be held by it. And you will not abandon my soul to Hades or let your Holy One see corruption. Peter says, we who stand before you, we who stand before you, we are witnesses of this fact. Uh, uh, the, the rumors are true. Jesus just spent 40 days with us after he was put to death. It's true. Our, our transformed and transforming lives are also proof. Are also proof. Check out Romans 1, 2, Romans 12, 1 and 2. Being transformed by the renewal of your mind. Why? Because God has, has touched you and you are now living a life sacrificially devoting it to him in the day to day. You and I willingly put Jesus to death. But God was behind it all and God raised Jesus to life. Number four, Jesus lives and he reigns over all. Peter says, Jesus is alive. He is present tense. He is exalted at the right hand of God, quote unquote, reigning over all. Over all. He is pouring forth his spirit upon those who are receiving, who received him as Savior and Lord for the express purpose. Let me, under, let me underscore this. Let me underline this. Let me highlight this. He is pouring out his spirit upon those who have received him as Savior and Lord for the express purpose of making him known. Salt is coming out of the bottle. We are telling you today, and it will be repeated over and over and over throughout the book of Acts. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other, no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved. Yes, we are discriminating. Yes, we are being prejudicial. Yes, we are being compassionate. Yes, we are imploring you 
to know Christ. Be reconciled to God. These are the core truths that Peter's preaching here in this passage. One of the most important elements of any sermon, I believe, however, is the so what? So what? What do I do with this now? You're, you're, you're telling me all this stuff. What do I do? Put it together for me. What is the life change that's being sought? What am I supposed to do with what is being shared? You have an episode of this. <clears throat> I'll get to it in a second. <clears throat> you know, Peter can urge... Uh, I got. I, I'm not. I, I, I'm. I, I'm. Uh, you know that when I communicate from the pulpit, that I work up a sweat. I go through shirts like no one else. And uh, Marlene Hagel said, "You know, uh, what, if you if you." You always talk about how hot it is up there. Why, why do you dress like you do? You've got a nice sweat. I said, well, I, I feel like I need to look decent. If it, were, I, uh, if it were up to me, I'd be here in shorts and a T-shirt, but I'd still perspire. Peter, here's the deal. Peter can urge. He can plead. He even hints at the action step, quoting from Luke's prophecy in verse 21. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. But at the end of it, at the end of it all, our primary role is to be faithful in communicating truth, the gospel, the gospel. I think I have it in your outline. The, the, the good news. Yeah, I have it. The, I have an, a statement of the gospel. The gospel, is, the gospel is the good news that God sent. He sent his son Jesus to live a sinless life. Die a substitutionary death. Big word there, but you can, you can work with that with someone. And rise from the dead so that, here's the so what, so that sinners who repent and trust and Jesus will be forgiven and have eternal life. It is the Holy Spirit's role to convict men of their sin. It is our role to be instruments made of clay, making him known. Here's the action step, and Peter speaks it to it straight flat out. Repent of your sins. God loves you. God loves you. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart. And they said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? You know what hit me when I read that passage this past week in preparing this message? What hit me was John the Baptist, who's, who's baptizing people at the river. I remember John the Baptist. And people crying out uh, at one point. This is in Luke's Gospel, chapter 3, 7 through 14. Read it. Read it, because he gives definitive examples of, what do we do now? And that's what they're asking here. Brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent. Repent. And be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. And you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But the promise is for you and for your children and for all who are far off. Remember, these people traveled hundreds of miles to come together for Pentecost. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to... Critical statement here. Everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. And with many other words he bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, save yourselves from this crooked generation. And so those who received his word were baptized, and there were added that day about 3,000 souls. Praise God. Praise God. This is a God thing. 
This is one of the most important roles of the church is to make him known. We are to be brutally honest about man's sin-infested soul and guilt at being an accomplice in the death of Jesus. But, but, also to let those we're sharing with know that the object of God's plan all along was to save. Save from eternal misery and loss and damnation. And once that proclamation has been made, in whatever context we might find ourselves, we are, we are beckoning the Holy Spirit to cut to the heart. That's a quote here, cut to the heart and save. And here's my closing question before we move into communion. Who are you burdened for? Who are you burdened for? Who are you asking God to save? There should be a name that just jumped out. Maybe more than one. Father, I pray that you would uh, do a work in our lives. That you would use these few minutes that we devote the family-wide worship, that they would, might be a concentrated form of, of engagement with you, of being touched by you, being met by you, being, being challenged and encouraged by you, so that when we leave, we are absolutely on fire through the Spirit to make you known, to fulfill the mission that you've given to us to go and to make, all, to make disciples of all people. Take advantage, open doors for us, Lord. Give us guidance. Give us the words. Thank you for this time. Bless the remainder as we move into that tangible, wonderful time of worship called the Lord's Supper, communion in your name. Amen. If you are helping, Please come on down.